that there is something very interesting about the pattern of behavior. So imagine that, imagine that sexual selection is working something like this, and, and, and we know that sexual selection is a very, 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 very powerful biological force, even though biologists ignored it for almost 100 years after Charles Darwin originally wrote about it, thinking mostly about natural selection. They didn't like the idea of sexual selection because it tended to introduce the notion of mind into the process of evolution because it, it deals with choice. You know, but, so imagine, on the one hand, that you have a male hierarchy. We know that the men at the top of the hierarchy are much more likely to be reproductively successful than the men at the bottom. That's particularly true of men. So you have twice as many female ancestors as you have male ancestors. I'm not going to do the math, but, and I know it doesn't sound plausible, but it, you could look it up and figure it out. And it's, it's, it's perfectly reasonable fact that it actually happens to be true. So there's twice as, you have twice as many female ancestors because females are twice as likely on average, to leave offspring as men. Now what happens is, any man, man who does reproduce tends to reproduce more than once, but a bunch of them reproduce zero. Whereas, so it would be, the average man who reproduces has two children, and the average man who doesn't reproduce has zero, obviously, and the average woman who reproduces has one child. So, that means that there's twice as many females in your line as there is males. So that, that's a big deal. And, and so, imagine that it works something like this. So, the men elect the, the, the competent men who are, are admired and who are, and who are uh, I can't say dominant, who are, who are given positions of authority and respect, let's put it that way. And it's like an election. Now, it could be an actual democratic election, but it's at least an election of consensus, or it's at least an election of, well, we're not going to kill him for now, which is also a form of election, right? It's a form of tolerance, you know? So, so and then what happens is the women, for their part, peel from the top of the male hierarchy. And so you've got two factors that are driving human sexual selection across vast stretches of evolutionary time. One is the election of men by men to positions where they're much more likely to reproduce, and the second is the tendency of women to peel off the top of male dominance hierarchies, which is extraordinarily well established cross-culturally. Even if you flatten out the socioeconomic uh, disparity, say, between men and women, like they've done in Scandinavia, you don't, you don't uh, uh, reduce the tendency of women to peel off the top of the male hierarchy by much. And why, why would you? I mean, women are smart. Why in the world wouldn't they go for, for, why wouldn't they strive to make relationships with men who are relatively successful? And why wouldn't they let the men themselves define why that, how that constitutes success? It makes sense. Like, if you want to figure out who the best man is, why not let the men compete and the, the, man, the man who wins, whatever the competition is, is the best man by definition. How else would you define it? So, okay, so why am I telling you all that? Well, the reason is, is because it seems to me that there's, this comp there's been this complex interplay across human evolution between the election of the male dominance hierarchy and sexual success. And that's a big deal if it's true. It could be, because what would happen, you see, is that as men evolved, they would evolve to be better and better at climbing up the male hierarchy because the ones who weren't good at that wouldn't reproduce so obviously that's going to happen but then it wouldn't just be a hierarchy because there's a whole bunch of different hierarchies and so then you might say well are there commonalities across hierarchies that's a reasonable thing to propose it, I mean they're not completely opposed to one another at least if you're more success, relatively more successful in one hierarchy then you're more probable, it's more probable that you'll be successful in another. And that's actually a really good definition of general intelligence or IQ. And that's actually one of the things that women select men for. Now, men also select women for that, but the selection pressure is even higher from women to men. And general IQ is one of the things that propels you up across dominance hierarchies because it's a general problem-solving mechanism. And the other thing that seems to do that to some degree is conscientiousness. And there's also some evidence that women prefer conscientious men. So, and, and of course, why wouldn't they? Because you can trust them, and, 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 and they work, and so those are both good things. So then you think, okay, so men have adapted to start to climb the male dominance hierarchy, but it's the set of all possible hierarchies that they're adapted to climb. And so then you think there's, there's a set of attributes that can be acted out, that, and that can be embodied, that will increase the probability that you're going to rise to the top of any given hierarchy. And then you could say, well, then as you adapt to that fact, then you start to develop an understanding of what that pattern constitutes. 
And so that starts to become the abstract representation of something like multidimensional competence. And that's like the abstraction of virtue itself. Well, and none of that has, then none of that's arbitrary, man. That's as bloody well grounded in biology as anything could be. And I think that's a really hard argument to refute. And like one of the things I should tell you about how I think is that when I think something, I spend a long time trying to figure out if it's wrong, you know, because I like to hack at it from every possible direction to see if it's a weak idea, because if it's a weak idea, then I'd rather just dispense with it and find something better. And I've had a real hard time trying to figure out what's wrong with that idea. I, it, it's, it seems to me that it's pretty damn solid. And then the idea that, you know, if you watch what people do in movies and so on, and when they're reading fiction, it's obvious that they're very good at identifying both the hero and the anti-hero. We could say the anti-hero, generally speaking, the bad guy, is someone who strives for, do, for, for authority and, and position, but fails. G generally speaking, not always, but fails. So he's a good, bad example. A kid, you take a kid to a, a good guy, bad guy movie, the kid figures out pretty fast that he's not supposed to be the bad guy. And, and figures out very quickly to zero in on the good guy. And that means that there's, there's an affinity between the pattern of good guy that's being played out in the fiction and the perceptual capacity of the child. You know, and one of the things I told my son when he was a kid, when I used to take him to movies that were sometimes more frightening than they should have been, but um, one of the things I always told him was, I never said don't be afraid, because I, I think that's bad advice for kids. What I said was, keep your eye on the hero, right? Keep your eye on the hero. And, he, and like, he was gripped by the movie and often quite afraid of them, you know, because movies can be very frightening. So he'd just like zero in on that guy and hoping, and you know what it's like in a movie, you hope that the good guy wins, generally speaking. And I mean, why do you do that? Where does that, where does that come from? You see how deeply rooted that is inside you. You'll bloody well go line up and pay to watch that happen. It's not an easy thing to understand. And it's, it's so self-evident to people that we don't even notice that it's a tremendous mystery. And so, is it so unreasonable to think that we would have actually, over the millennia, come to some sort of collective conclusion about what the best of the best guys are, or best of the good guys are, and what the worst of the bad guys are? And to me, archetypally speaking, thinking of that as the, the hostile brothers, so that's Christ and Satan, or Cain and Abel, for example, very common mythological motif, the hostile brothers, it's like, those are, those, those are archetypes, it's like, the, the Satan, for example, is by definition the worst that a person can be. And Christ, by definition, this is independent of anything but conceptualization, is by definition the best that a, that a man can be. Now, as I said, I'm speaking psychologically and conceptually, but I, I, given our capacity for imagination and our ability to engage in fiction, and our love for fiction and our capacity to dramatize and our love for the story, stories of heroism and catastrophe and, and good and evil, I can't see how it could be any other way. Like, so, well, so, so that's part of the idea that's driving the notion of the evolution of the idea of God, and, and even more specifically, driving the evolution of the idea, at least in part, of the Trinity.